Hi. Today I want to talk about one of the artists who has influenced me a great deal and whose work isn't really that well known, particularly in the United States. Um, he was incredibly prolific and productive in his life, but um, you know, he's a British illustrator, was a British illustrator, so that may mean that he's not that well known in the United States, but I think he deserves, um, you know, to, to get some attention. His name is Paul Hogarth, and he, if that name Hogarth sounds familiar, it's because he actually is a descendant of uh, William Hogarth, a painter and sort of uh, depictor of working class life from the 18th century. Um, but Hogarth, Paul Hogarth that is, was born in 1917 and he passed away in 2001. So he had a long and fruitful career as, as an illustrator. And for those of you who like me are interested in, um, well, first of all, drawing in ink and then combining with watercolor, you'll find a lot to learn from his work. And also, um, he was a really fantastic travel illustrator and traveled to many parts of the world in his life and produced a lot of um, illustrations about those travels. So there's a lot to learn from him there too. But I just love his work and um, I want to talk a bit about it and tell you some of the things that I think are exceptional and that have been helpful to me. So I'm going to show you several different books. Um, this is the first one. It's called Drawing on Life, and it's actually his autobiography. It came out just, or at least this revised edition came out just after he died, so it's very, very complete. Um, and so Hogarth, as I said, he grew up as a, in a working class family, and he, his father was actually a butcher, um, and Paul used to draw on the butcher paper, the big brown rolls of paper that's so beautiful. Um, he would draw on that with, with a you know, little bitten off pencil. But he, despite you know, the fact that he was growing up during the Depression, right, and the, and the Depression was in England as well, of course, um, it was hard times and hard times to be an artist, but he was driven and he took little classes here and there that were free and eventually he managed to get a uh, uh, what's it called, a scholarship to the Manchester School of Art. So he was able to go to school and to learn there. Um, but, you know, he was challenged by his parents throughout it, and um, he had a lot of struggles with them. But um, so here, this book begins, of course, with his childhood. Um, and then what happens is relatively early on, he becomes very left-wing. So this is, again, England in the 30s, and he comes from a, a family that was working class but supportive of the Conservative Party. So it was not um, encouraged to be essentially a communist, which is what he was. And then during the mid-30s, 1936, 37, the Spanish Civil War began, and that was, of course, a conflict between the fascists and the communists. And he became very supportive of that and, in fact, went to Spain, left art school, went to Spain, and um, drove trucks or something like that for the resistance. And then he came back to uh, England and he became, again, this is before he completed, he had, I think he completed three years of art school, but he became very involved with the local Communist Party and he started making propaganda posters and things like that to sort of support the workers' struggles. And then, of course, World War II began. Um, and so when World War II began, you know, he had some problems because he was a communist, um, but he, you know, served in the army. And after the war ended, he became um, essentially an, an art director, hiring other illustrators, but working, uh, again, in support of of the Communist Party, and of course, after World War II, the party now had uh, the, you know, the Soviet Union had taken over large parts of Eastern Europe, and he was doing work in support of that cause and traveling to various parts of the world to document 
um, you know, these new emerging countries there. So I just want to show you some of the drawings that are, are particularly favorites of mine. Um, this is one of the Spanish resistance fighters. I just love this drawing. It's always uh, influenced me just because of the boldness of his ink. And, um, you know, so you see in his early books a lot of this, as he calls it here, travels behind the Iron Curtain, traveling to places like Poland, uh, doing this beautiful pencil drawing there, just recording, you know, these cityscapes and also the people who live there, you know, somewhat influenced in a way by sort of communist propaganda posters, sort of the noble worker, but done in this loose reportage style. And he was, again, one of the early reportage artists. Here he is in traveling to the Yangtze. So he was going to China just 1954, this drawing is done. So it's just at the dawn of the communists' um, control of China, Shanghai. And so lots of small drawings in this book, um, but we'll get to sort of larger ones later on. Because essentially what happens in to Hogarth's career is he, he goes from being this sort of ardent communist and doing propaganda posters to eventually sort of becoming a relatively traditional illustrator. I mean, he does, he does um, illustrations for Shell Oil at one point. He also is a teacher teaching uh, students reportage. He looks for ways of making a living in various ways, but really the thing that he's most famous for is um, doing book illustrations, specifically covers. And I'm going to take you through some of that in, in, the, in a little while. But I just want to focus on his style of drawing, which is both loose and specific. I mean, this is clearly a portrait of a particular man, but this, this looseness of his style, again, will seem familiar to you who know the work of, of some of the sketchbook school teachers like Veronica Lawler, or Melanie Ween. Um, this, this style of drawing on location and in a loose way. But I think most crucially what he does is he is able to boil down the essence of the stories of the scenes to them only the essentials. They're not necessarily spare, but they're making a strong graphic statement. Um, like you take a drawing like this, it's very beautiful and kind of minimalized in a way. It's very graphic. Um, and yet he's drawing every single brick in the building. Drawing people almost as an afterthought. Or a lithograph like this Again, reducing things to their essence, to these basic colors. That watercolor, just the sea as this sheet. Um, I'm a big fan of this kind of drawing, where he's drawn, again, every brick on every building, every sign, the people walking down the street, the distance. There's a huge amount of information in here, but yet it seems simple, and it's using black, white, and gray in an incredibly elegant, powerful way, I think. Textures like this, Coney Island. He did a lot of drawing in the United States. Um, so, and here there's, there's some color in this book as well, so you get to see his watercolors. But this, to me, is a classic Hogarth drawing of this sort of rat's nest of telegraph wires. Um, this is painted in uh, in the United States in, Mass in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Again, reducing this to this essential shape, but then putting all this texture in it and these trees that are almost a rhythmic pattern, um, so simplified. So there's a lot of power to that drawing. You know, he's, he's drawn the environment that it's in. It's not floating by itself. He's drawn the texture, and yet that picture is very quickly digestible, done entirely in, uh, in pencil. The street. You know, his work is 
sometimes reminiscent of David Gentleman, who I showed in a previous episode of the Sketchbook Club. But it's much looser. It's much more um, expressive in its way. He's editorializing about the nature of these people and the relationships between these shapes in the landscape. And look at this drawing. This is people coming out of Fenway Park and uh, flowing right into these, the strip mall here. But you get that sense of that anarchy, the energy coming out of the ballpark, all the thousands of people flowing through. And yet this drawing has a simplicity to it that I think is really beautiful as well. Look at the way that is laid out on the page. The simplicity of this watercolor. See, he's painted these giant shapes, right? He's painted the primary shapes essentially with one watercolor wash, then he's added a little bit of dimension, but then he's gone in and he's added this other layer of detail with pen to describe every brick, every, every piece of um, ornament, every window. So it's almost like two passes at this building. You know, this is the looseness of the watercolor gives it that energy and then the specificity of his line work is really important too. I think this is a lot to learn from him. So that's this book. I'm not going to go endlessly into it, but I, I strongly recommend it, Drawing on Life. That's his autobiography. Let me show you something else. So one of the things that he was noted for, as I said before, was book covers. But specifically, he did the covers for every edition of Graham Greene's books. You probably know Graham Greene, um, particularly in the 60s and 70s. He was one of the sort of giants of, um, I guess you could call it international fiction, writing about um, the colonies to some extent, but really writing about politics and drama and romance and mystery. There's all kinds of things in Graham Greene's books. They're fantastic. If you've never read, read any of them, I would start with something like The Heart of the Matter. But he would he did with this book is he traveled to the locations of every single one of the Graham Greene books and he did as much research as he could so that he could paint any site that was mentioned in any one of the books. So think about that as a, as a, as a challenge. Um, we're talking about you know, a couple of dozen books and he went all around the world and he, you know, these are all the places you can see a little drawing of him there, um, traveling all around the world and recording these places. So this book, um, endorsed by Graham Greene, he actually wrote the introduction, but it's divided up into the various books and there's also a little diary section in each case of what Hogarth's experience was going to these places and what he um, experienced you know, while he was there, while doing these drawings. So I think it's great. People that he saw train stations. So he spent a year doing this. Pretty amazing, traveling all over the world, just recording, again, each, each book. So each, each sort of section of this book is, um, depicts another book, England Made Me, and here he is, you know, recording. Um, he writes a little bit about the book, and then he goes to all the locations in Stockholm, in this case, and records each of them. So lots and lots of, I mean, amazing travel journaling, Lots and lots of beautiful stuff in here, in Africa, Vietnam, um, all around the world, as he recorded. And just the different ways that he, I mean, again, I love this drawing. I love that shape, how simple this is, right? Brown, sunset, you know, um, this is Travels with My Aunt. And, uh, you know, he's just recording. This is, I think, in France, but he's drawn every rock every piece of it, but yet so simple and complex. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. You still get the feeling that even though these are incredibly detailed, they're also done quickly. Um, you know, he spent time, but he drew what he saw as he saw it. You know, there's not necessarily an awful lot of preparatory drawings. There may have been some thumbnails, you know, to design this page, and then sitting down drawing every tree. 
but he probably th there's thoughts behind this. I think that's one of the things that strikes me about his work is that it's that it, it's intelligent, it's thoughtful, it's commenting on what he's seeing. So, as I said, Paul Hogarth was um, was a teacher as well, and he wrote a couple of books that were um, didactic, that teaching you stuff. Uh, he was famous also for when he was a teacher, this is in the 1950s, taking art students out of the classroom and taking them to locations, um, which was an unusual thing to have done at that time. But he was really the first, one of the first teachers to say, let's not sit in the studio, let's not sit in, in the schoolroom, but let's get out and sit on the street and draw people. So anyway, he, he did a couple of books. This one is called Creative Pencil Drawing, and it is full of very specific things. I mean, he goes through at the beginning, he'll really talk about materials, you know, tells you about different kinds of pencils and pencil holders. Um, and here's a section of just stools, different kinds of stools you can use. Actually, these are, I actually own several of these stools now, so that's quite useful. Um, so even though this book is, I think, where is it from? It's from the, it's 1964, but it's still really as relevant. I mean, the art supply world doesn't doesn't change that much over the years. But, uh, but again, this is the drawing I showed you before in his other book. Every brick, you know, uh, and a lot of his drawings are not just pure pencil. But he often combines different materials. So this is a great book, and here's an example of some of these book covers that he was doing, and he talks about that. So it's a great book. Look at that. Fantastic. So in every medium that he works, there's a similarity. I mean, even when he draws people, similarity of that, the impact of like the big, bold shape, but then also the details that go in there that, um, that give you much more information. So, and his drawings are somewhat crude, you know? I mean, I think he's, his, it, it may not be for everyone, this style, but I do think that it is something that can inform anybody, just in terms of the things that he knows about how to tell a story with a picture. Um, so, this book has also got practical advice on how to, different kinds of illustration and so forth. But this is the book that I love the most that he did, and I use this book a lot, Creative Ink Drawing. And, man, this book is great. So, so many different styles of using techniques, like something like this. This is done with diluted ink, it's drawn with a brush, and it's, again, a beautiful piece of composition. And then he has these two little characters down here that were drawn probably with a crow quill. So lots of different, again, at this book he explains techniques, he explains materials. But you look at something like this, and this is really much more difficult to do than it looks. Very simple, bold shapes, but getting those shapes right, getting this composition right, this balance, that is something that I think takes a lot of practice and uh, thought. But he explains here, in each drawing, how he drew it, how big it is. You know, he says and I, he drew this with a dip pen and a large brush. So he drew it quickly, because that's a lot of what he is interested in, is how, as, a, as an illustrator, how can you work effectively so you can use your time well? You know, if you travel to a place, you have to knock out a whole bunch of drawings. You can't agonize over each one. You have to be productive and yet expressive. And um, so that's a lot of what he's doing here. And look at this book jacket. There's a certain crudeness again to it, but a power as well. And that's a fantastic drawing. New York City, 1963. These levels. You know, and it's a really interesting technique to try using different width, widths and thicknesses of your media to indicate space. So here, you see lots of details here. You see fewer details here, right, because it's further away. There's also the cacophony of street signage, which is, you know, a typical thing in a big city. Again, he goes into, in these pages, he goes into talking specifically about what kinds of inks and, and brushes to use. Um, or that he uses. Drawing with a steel pen. So again, not a, not a thing that is necessarily that common now, but a fantastic thing to do to draw with a dip pen, or as he, he'll call them, um, a steel pen. How to choose 
a nib, how to choose the holder that you use. And, you know, he's drawing this on location on a sheet of paper, but he explains, you know, exactly what he's using. All materials you can buy still. Um, and how to draw this detail and all the sense of movement. So, a really useful and powerful book. Lots of different styles, again, within the same drawing. Drawing, you know, more broadly with one pen, probably, and then, um, you know, he's yeah, he's using a Gillo 404 and a Spencerian school nib. So he's using different different nibs in the same drawing to get different effects. This is a drawing with um, a, dip, a wooden a reed pen, a bamboo pen. How to cut one? How to cut a quill feather? So useful skills that uh, you know. See all this detail, every single word that was on the windows he's drawn, every single brick, and yet the composition is bold and simple. This is one of my favorite drawings. I've, I've actually reproduced this drawing, copied it line for line because I find this composition so beautiful. So what he's done here is he's drawn with a reed pen and with a brush. So this is loose, it's rough, you get the sense of the texture of the paper, and then this much finer. It's probably quite a large drawing. He's written some stuff here to annotate it. really great. That the complexity of McSorley's bar, I've drawn in this bar as well, and it is a hodgepodge of people and stuff everywhere. But then these bold shapes on top of it. So that draws your eye in, right? It draws your eye into the dark parts, so that it isn't just, um, you know, sort of just a chaos of line and detail. There's a lot of the signage. It's obviously part of the modern landscape is being able to copy down the lettering that you see, but also give it your own interpretation. Look at this drawing. You know, this is done with um, a nib and a brush. So he draws these trees with this big brush and then draws these fine lines with a dip pen. So you really get the sense of depth to that drawing from the sign all the way back to these trees behind that, that house. There's that drawing I talked about before in the other book. But here you see how powerful that is. Again, combination of brush and school nib. So this book is full of interesting things. And some of them not reproduced terribly well, like these suffer a bit for having been made in 1964. But um, this is just, a, again, a brush painting. And he explains, you know, again, how to, how to produce stuff that can reproduce properly, um, how, to, how to design something that will use type as well, like this magazine cover. Um, you know, here's, here he shows this drawing that he did of Times Square. I mean, look at how fascinating this is. Huge focus on this grid, right, of the, uh, what's it called, the, you know, this, the thing that goes down to the sewer. And yet, all this detail back here where he's drawn every street sign all going to the distance. So this, obviously your eyes are drawn in by these lines, your eyes are drawn in by the fact that there's detail back here, and then there's all this white space. And here he shows how he took that same drawing and used it as the basis for this cover. You know, so that white space is an accidental, it's actually there to contain the type. Here he's explaining how he made this book jacket using and how he created different 
pieces of art that were then combined, something that now we would take for granted. We would do it in Photoshop in a, in a flash, but in those days, it was a bit more of a complicated thing, 1963. So he has sections on drawing people, drawing buildings. I mean, it's really an art school in a book. It's a fantastic book. I'm sure you can find it. I'm sure you can. I'm sure there's different editions of it. It's available. It's really useful. Um, and if you're, again, thinking about drawing with a pen and different kinds of pens, you know, I think a lot of what he talks about would also apply to using modern pens, using, um, you know, the sort of fiber tip markers that we use a lot now. But the, yeah, in terms of the composition, in terms of the balance of line, the fact that he's doing it with a Spencerian nib, nib in 1963 with Higgins ink, which doesn't mean that it isn't useful today. But it, um, but it is also a way of encouraging you to take that step and try working with these more traditional materials. Um, I love them. I think they're really expressive. And, you know, they're, it's not the kind of thing that you... You need to go back and look at old books to find out how they use them. It's not terribly hard. Um, they're not expensive. And they are really, um, I think... A great way also to be connected to the path, past, to also to understand the work of illustrators from previous golden ages. You know, I mean, certainly the 60s, the 50s, they all were times of lots of powerful illustrators. But he's a reportage artist, which is interesting too. So he's using these materials in the field. He's using them to work quickly to tell stories. So there's a lot to learn from him. All right, so that's Paul Hogarth. Um, I think that if you're doing urban sketching, and you uh, are looking for new ways to capture the environment around you, if you're looking for ways to, to tell a story, because I think a lot of times we're tempted when we do an urban sketch to sit down and to draw absolutely everything we see. Um, and I think what you can learn from him is to say, you can edit the landscape to tell that same story, but you want to do something that's coherent. In other words, yes, you may want to draw a building and the stuff around it, the signage, the people crossing the street, the street lamps, the pavement, all that stuff. And you can, but you can also edit it so that you only draw parts of it, like you only draw part of the grid on the sidewalk to indicate, to lead your eye up to Times Square in the background. You don't necessarily draw every building all around you. You don't necessarily draw every single thing. There's that you, you set priorities by thinking about what is it you actually want to say. What is it that it, what was your eye actually attracted to? Um, so studying accomplished artists like this, and also some of the teachers in our school, speaking of urban sketching, I live in the city and you can hear the ubiquitous fire engine passing by. Anyway, um, you know, I apply these things that I've learned from him to drawing on the iPad. He's helped me a lot in the last uh, couple months as I've been working on my iPad skills to think about, you know, with an iPad using um, some of the apps that are available, you have every tool known to man in its virtual form, right? So you can draw with watercolors and pens and pencils and brushes and all kinds of things. So how do you figure out what you want and what effects to use? Um, looking at artists like this and even reproducing their work line for line, which I've done quite a lot with, um, with Hogarth is to, is to say, um, don't get overwhelmed. You know, think about, look at the masters who come before you and see what they did. And even though you're applying it in a different way, it's still valid, it's still useful. Um, you don't have to start from nothing. So Paul Hogarth, as you see, there's an awful lot to learn from him. Check out one of his books, my highest um, recommendation is for creative ink drawing. And uh, you could also look him up online. There's a lot of his work represented there. He's, uh, as I said, very prolific, you know, basically produced illustrations for over half a century and, uh, you know, in lots of different forms. He's drawn everything from people to places, um, to things from his imagination, all kinds of stuff. A great artist and a great inspiration. Thanks for joining me again. And uh, I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.